Welcome into Stefan Diggs Distraction Central. We're talking Sabres, although I do have a Sabres Diggs comparison coming up later in the show. All ahead here on the Locked On Sabres podcast. Your Locked On Sabres, your daily podcast on the Buffalo Sabres. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thanks for making Locked On Sabres your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast. That includes our YouTube channel, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Locked On NHL for $20 off your first purchase. Sneaky Joe DiBiase coming to you after a Sabres win on Jeff Skinner night. We will talk. All about the night that was another great celebratory night, a great job by the Sabres. The players gave another great effort on one of these nights. We got some goals from the top line again. Skinner came close, wasn't able to close the deal, but still a fun night with the team wearing the goat heads uh, in the arena. And by the way, it is the third time this year that I have sat in our WGR suite on the club level. And in those three games... December against Toronto, where they won 9-3. to three. Uh, Earlier in March against the Red Wings, when they won 7-3. to three. And then last night, with the Sabres winning 6-2, to two, when I'm in that suite, the Sabres have won 22-6. to six. So, come on. I need that. That suite should be mine for here on, until they at least lose. We'll get to all that was the night against the Washington Capitals, and uh, the Sabres did make a roster move. Devin Levi down to Rochester. I got a, a word on that. Uh, is is a momentous day in Buffalo sports. Many of you, I mean, most of you, 90-plus percent, are Sabre fans and Buffalo Bills fans. Check out the Locked On Bills podcast. Uh, Joe Marino is going to have a, a great do a great job covering all that is happening here on Wednesday. Stephon Diggs is traded. From the Buffalo Bills to the Houston Texans. Stay tuned in the third segment of today's show. That trade just smells and reeks exactly like the Ryan O'Reilly trade to me. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Terry Pagula was in the building last night for Sabres and Capitals. So I'll try to connect some dots there. I'll explain why as I thought about the Diggs trade on Wednesday. It made me think a lot about when the Sabres traded Ryan O'Reilly. A lot of similarities. That's a little bit later on, though, in today's show. If you'd like to reach out, I had some of you uh, talking about the O'Reilly to Diggs comparison. We also, in the chat today, we're going back and forth about a conversation that Jeff Merrick of Sportsnet and ESPN's Greg Wyshynski had uh, today, which was debating whether John Tortorella is a good idea for the Sabres this offseason. Spoiler alert, Jeff is hard yes that Tortorella fits the Sabres, and Wyshynski is hard no. That is not a good idea. So if you want to check out that conversation that we've been having ongoing, uh, you can sign up, join subtext.com slash locked on Sabres. Tortorella, by the way, will make him the uh, the feature of today's Buffalo Sabres droughtology. He's in the news a lot lately. He had a a crazy press conference two days ago where he's calling out all his players, saying the goalie's the only guy that showed up. Today, he went on a 15-minute rant about the state of the team and players and the media and um, swearing in it like Tortorella is off the chain right now as he watches his team fall apart, potentially out of the playoffs. They've owned, they've won, they've lost eight of their last ten. Tortorella off the rails, our droughtology of the day. Uh, is revolving around torts. Since the Sabres last made the playoffs, John Tortorella has coached four different teams, and if Philadelphia makes it this year, they're in a spot right now, he will have made the playoffs with four different franchises since the Sabres last made the playoffs, and will have coached, He will. he's already coached 62 playoff games since the Sabres last co- played in a playoff game. Tortorella's been to New York, Vancouver, Columbus, and now Philadelphia. Uh, excuse me, three of the four teams he would have uh, made the playoffs with. He did not make it in that one year with Vancouver. But anyways, Tortorella, 
if you're following along on what's going on in Philadelphia, that dude is off the rails right now. So the Sabres get the win 6-2. to two. They showed up. Listen, one thing the Sabres do, they are not a consistent hockey team. Or they are consistent in that they are inconsistent. They go every other game. They have they are the the most mid team that I have ever seen. Their record stands at 36, 35, and 5. They have no long streaks this year, only two win streaks of three games or longer, and only three losing streaks of three games or longer, and nothing more than four games. They don't get hot. They don't get cold. Look at the last five games. Win, loss, win, loss, win. That is the story of their season. But one area, one type of game they always show up for is when it is time to celebrate somebody, the Sabres play well. And they oftentimes dominate. Go all the way back to uh, the original RJ night when they retired Rick Jenneret's banner. That night was for RJ, and the Sabres showed up. They beat the Predators. They played very well in that game. Then, later that season, RJ's last game, right? It's the final game of the season. It's his final game calling it, and Casey Middlestat wins it in overtime against Chicago. They they played well in that game and won. That was two for two. If you go to the next year, Ryan Miller night. Ryan Miller night against the New York Islanders. The Sabres won in overtime on a Hail Mary pass from Rasmus Dahlin to Dylan Cousins. That was a night to celebrate someone. Hey, Ryan Miller, we want him to come out on the ice and celebrate him after a win. You got to win that hockey game. The Sabres also won Craig Anderson's final game. His final game in the NHL, that was middle stat in overtime again, end of last season. Uh, and the Sabres did the job against Ottawa. So they won that game. The only one you could point to that they didn't win is Kyle Poso's 1,000th game a little bit earlier on. That was a night to celebrate a Poso. Horrible night to be in that arena. No energy whatsoever. Oposo not nearly as beloved as Jeff Skinner, in my opinion. And the Sabres got trounced. So that's the one exception. But then there was last night. Skinner's 1,000th game. His teammates love him. Video messages up on the board. They're doing the two between two stall stuff. And the Sabres dominate the Capitals 6-2. to two. And they never let their foot off the gas. I didn't think they started well. They gave up a goal only three minutes in. That's been the story of their season, right? Um, And I thought it was looking early like they're going to get run over. They had a couple of really bad shifts in the first five minutes of action. But once they got their feet under them, they got a couple of goals and there was no looking back. Um, From the midpoint of the first period on to the end of the game, the Sabres won the hockey game 6-1. to Uh, They smoked the Capitals, outshot them 35 to 25. They had a bajillion chances in this game. They could have had more than six goals. Uh, J.J. Paterka, who scored two goals, and we'll talk about him in the second segment of today's show, had a glorious one-timer on the right wing in the second period that he got robbed on. Zach Benson got robbed by uh, Charlie Lindgren on a play that made SportsCenter top 10. Lindgren made SportsCenter top 10 for a save he made on Benson at the net front, Benson lifted it too. It's just an incredible save. That could have been a goal very easily. Jeff Skinner had a couple of really good chances, including in the third period, he drags the puck out away from the goaltender outside of the crease. He gets Lindgren down, and then he tries to loft it over him, and he hits the crossbar, almost scoring into what was a pretty open net. So that's at least three more goals. The Sabres very easily could have had there was a couple of posts they hit too um it could have been nine goals easily really and I know they scored six so they dominated they played great they ran away with it in the third period it's another one of these nights where hey it's time to celebrate someone how are you gonna play and they show up when it's time to do that so what that means is they should do that every night uh how about Friday let's celebrate Jeff Skinner's 1000th and uh, first game how about we celebrate uh Zach Benson's uh, 60th game or 70th game in the NHL. Uh, let's let's keep that train rolling because the Sabres keep playing well in those spots. Uh, it also could be in part because of fan energy, right? There is a stat out there. I don't know if the top of my head, but there's a stat out there that the Sabres play great and they have a very good record when the building is more than three quarters full. So when you look at that, it's okay. Well, when there's energy in the crowd, that's when they play great. 
And on these nights, you often have full buildings. Last night wasn't quite that. It was around 15,000. But the the crowd was juiced up from the get-go. So that could be a reason why this happens uh, as well. But the ceremony was great. That's one area the Sabres are great at now. Ever since the Dominic Hasek jersey retirement, was that, eight, nine years ago now, which was horrible. It was awkward, and it was short, and it was weird. Hashik standing there by himself, watching his banner go up, whereas no friends and family are around, no former teammates are around. They actually had, I think, Rene Robert and Gilbert Perot uh, come out, if I remember correctly, and those guys didn't play with Hashik. It was just, hey, let's get the best legends we can get our hands on. Where was Pekka? Where was Shatan? Where was where, the, the friends and family? Again, it doesn't even have to be former players. This was like they do a great job now. Skinner, flowers from the for, from the teammates, the team picture. They got the, the the mom and the dad and the sisters and the girlfriend out there. It would have cool if they brought the dog out too, because that was a, a cool video that they had during the game. And they have the the tribute video up there. Um, nice ceremony. Kevin Adams brings out a silver stick. For Jeff Skinner for his thousandth game, um, they it, it's a great job that the Sabers do now. And then they theme the whole night after that player. Skinner highlights the between two stalls stuff. Uh, I did not love necessarily when they put up uh, th- uh, tribute videos from a, a lot of guys that Saber fans don't like. Cam Ward, Eric Stahl, Jason Spezza. Didn't need to see those guys participate, but I get it. I mean, former teammates uh, of Skinner. So cool night for him. I thought he played well, by the way. He had a bunch of chances, uh, just didn't find the back of the net. But it was okay because that Thompson, Tuck, and Paterka line picked up the slack. J.J. Paterka, this guy, the number one star, kind of stole the night a little bit with his performance. On Paterka's performance and why I am truly believing he is now in line for a contract extension this summer. That's coming up here on the Lockdown Sabres podcast. We are presented by Game Time. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. We're only a quick drive up the QEW to Toronto. If you're a Yankees fan, if you're a Red Sox fan or Blue Jays fan, you want to take a quick trip up to see your favorite team play. uh, It's not too far away and game time is the place to go. Prices on the game time app actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. Killer last minute deals, all in prices. My favorite uh, feature is views from your seat. You know exactly what you'll be looking at before you get there. Game time takes the guesswork out of buying major league baseball tickets. The last minute ticket deal No exaggeration. Those tickets are available right up to the minute of the event. And sometimes as far as an hour after the event starts, you can still get tickets through game time. Last minute deals, save up to 60% off buying last minute minute for sports and concerts, comedy, theater, and more. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, use the code locked on NHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again, create an account and redeem code locked on NHL for $20 off. Download the game time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Back here on the Locked On Sabres podcast. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. I'm trying to be your best uh, digs distraction possible for the Buffalo sports fan out there uh, today. But if you do want a lot of good digs coverage, I mentioned Locked On Bills, of course, with Joe Marino. Also, check out Locked On Sports today. No doubt they'll be talking about this biggest biggest story in the NFL by a mile this week, the Diggs trade to Houston. And if you're looking for the Houston perspective too, it's a good chance to check out Lockdown Sports today. Uh, can't miss analysis, opinions, news, streaming 24-7 on YouTube, or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. The Sabres beat the Capitals 6-2, to two, and it was a fun night to be in the building and in the arena, and they... Scored a bunch of goals, which is always fun. And two of those goals were scored by J.J. Paterka, who has retaken the lead with 28 goals on the season. He is two away from 30, and I think he's going to get there, even though there's only a handful of games left. Uh, I He's well on track, I think, to do that. So we'll see. But I think Paterka is on his way to a 30-goal season. Paterka actually scored on the power play. In this game, which is rare for him, 28 goals. That was only his third power play goal of the season, and it was a nice one. I love the puck movement, Darlene to Thompson, 
who goes cross ice to Zach Benson. And then Benson, there are times when you'll want him to shoot this. He's got two options. Benson, who is such a smart player, and I, I love the decisions that he makes uh, in all areas. I think if he gets faster and stronger, which I would expect, he is just going to be in a, an incredibly dominant player. But Benson's got the puck on the left. And he's got two options. He's got a defenseman that's kind of shallow to his right. The goaltender is facing him. He could shoot it. He's got an opening. But the goalie's in good position. And the way Benson's season's gone and where he's at as a player, he's not going to beat the goaltender very often there. He is not ready yet to score that goal on a consistent basis. If it's his only option, then you got to take it. You don't want to force anything. This was not forcing it, though. Benson kind of looks off the goalie and the defenseman and he's got he's got Alex Tuck in front of the net. That's where the pass is supposed to go. Tuck is set up to shovel it in from the front. And that's where Benson goes with the puck. And it's going to space regardless, even if Tuck doesn't get it. And that's what happens. Tuck misses it. I think Tuck should have scored the goal. And it would have been a pretty easy one for him. It was a little bit of a hot pass, which it had to be. But Tuck doesn't get a hold of it. And the puck goes off to Paterka, who is also on the goal line. And Paterka has it below the goal line. The goalie's out of position. You've got a defender charging down from the half wall to meet him at the goal line to not let him shoot it. So Paterka has got to be lightning quick on this power play goal. He has got to get the puck from his backhand to his forehand in like a tenth or two tenths of a second if he's going to get this pet, this puck off his stick in time so that the, the defender doesn't reach him and that the goalie doesn't get back into position. And all the while, he's got to do that that fast at an angle that is that it is so narrow. He has got to fit this puck in, and that's exactly what he does. Backhand, forehand, puck off his stick and in the net. It's a great goal by Paterka. He has got that goal-scoring acumen. The five-on-five goal he scores before that, uh, or after that in the second period, is also a quick hands finishing goal. It is get sent in alone, talk with an amazing forecheck. I, I, how many times do I got to call Alex Tuck the greatest forechecker in the NHL today before people start believing me? He's the best forechecker in the National Hockey League. And there he was creating a turnover and – the, he gets the puck down to Paterka, who has who's behind the play, alone with Lindgren, and he goes backhand, forehand, super quick hands, and then lifts it over his glove. It looks effortless to Paterka. He is playing on another level since he's gone up with Alex Tuck and Tage Thompson. It makes you think, man, if they had gotten to that combination before the last 10 days, how many goals would he have? Could he have gotten to 40? Playing with those two all season, it's not impossible. Although I know Thompson had a tough year and uh, he dealt with injury as well along the way. But Paterka has just been so impressive. And more and more, he just looks like he's got every tool in the tool bag to be a consistent, I don't even want to say top six anymore. I don't feel like that's giving him enough credit. I want to say top line, top line left winger in the NHL scoring 30 goals consistently. I don't see any reason why he can't do that. Tell me a a, a part of his game. That's going to stop him from doing it. Like Thompson, even I could point to, he's not a very well-balanced skater and he gets pushed off the puck more easily than he should for his size. If I look at, I mean, uh, how about uh, Dylan cousins though? Cousins is one of these guys where I don't really know what the thing is with him. He's more of a confusion here. But if I go to Paterka's game, like point to the thing that's going to stop him from being a consistent 30 goal scorer, I don't know what you would point to. He is one of the fastest players on the team, maybe the fastest, maybe the quickest, maybe not the fastest, but the quickest. He's got maybe the quickest hands on the team, and he's got one of the best shots on the team. So what is it? He's got it all. And I think it is going to be a very interesting conversation this summer about whether or not they're going to pay him. And that will be maybe one of our top storylines of the summer here on this show is will they pay him and what will that contract look like? I tweeted out just randomly yesterday, like, what do we think? Seven times six? And most response I got was, he's not taking that. You're going to have to give him more than that. And I don't mind that. Seven times seven maybe is a better deal for Paterka. There's two schools of thought, and one of which I think is a lot 
smarter of a way to go about things than the other. One school of thought, which I think is the better way, is judge the player individually and understand, okay, do we want this guy for seven years and this at this money? Is he worth it? Is he going to regress? Is he going to grow? And I think if you want to make your bet on J.J. Paterka, I think you're going to get more growth, more than regression, and I think you pay him. I think you give him the contract. The second school of thought, which I do not tend to agree with, but I've seen out there, so it's worth mentioning, is it's more about the group than it is Paterka. you got to look at that group and say, you guys haven't achieved anything yet. This core of players does not deserve another seven-year contract locked in. you got to win something before we give somebody else a massive contract. While that might sound good, I just don't think that's great practice. I think you want the the former. You want to judge the player individually. And if you do that, I don't know what the argument is against paying J.J. Paterka. Other than maybe you want to do him, see, see him do it more than one year, which I guess is, is not totally unfair. Uh, but he's been great. And again, we'll talk more about the contract once the season ends. But that's going to be a big talking point this summer. When we come back, why the Diggs trade for the Bills reminds me of the Ryan O'Reilly trade back in the day for the Sabres. That's coming up here on the Locked On Sabres podcast. We are presented here on the show by FanDuel Sportsbook. A lot's going on right now. College hoops, NBA playoffs are nearing. The NHL playoffs, of course, as well, are only a couple of weeks away. You've got the NFL draft, too, depending on what state you're in. And college hoops is not over yet. Women's bracket and the men's bracket. Say goodbye to your busted bracket because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers will get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on anything. Point spreads, money lines. I'm a big futures guy, so if you want to pick on who's going to win it all, uh, that's another opportunity for you. Just visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. Bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Final segment here on the Locked On Sabres podcast. They can make us your first listen every day. The Buffalo Bills trade Stephon Diggs, one of their all-time players. I mean, he is he's what made the best receiver I've ever seen for them in my entire life, and it's not even close. But I'm too young to remember Andre Reid, of course. A momentous day. We'll remember it forever. You will, you probably, it'll be one of these days where you remember where you were. And for me, that's going to be, I guess, sitting at home on the couch eating lunch, um, remembering where I was. So nothing too impressive for me. I know Mike Show from WGR said he's in Florida right now. Uh, he'll always remember this Moana exhibit. He's, I don't know what he, where he's at, but he'll have a story to tell on that, I'm sure, forever. He was at a Moana exhibit when he found that out. I remember where I was for certain trades, and we'll get to the O'Reilly trade. I remember where I was for the Ryan O'Reilly trade. I was at uh, Taffy's in Orchard Park, uh, just a hot dog place on a cool summer day. So this will be one of those trades. Bills fans and Buffalo sports fans are trying to understand what happened here. You are taking on so much money, and we could get more into the weeds on, you'll hear it on Lockdown Bills, and I'll be on WGR Sports Radio 550, of course, Thursday morning for this. Um, we don't need to get too into the weeds on digs for, like, what what, what were you trying to explain it? But other than one area that relates to the Sabres that I want to mention here on the show, as I wa- saw the digs fallout happening for the first 10 minutes after it happened, the thought that I could not get out of my head is this is the O'Reilly trade, isn't it? Now, I don't know that, but I it's it, this is the O'Reilly trade. Last night at Key Bank Center for Sabres and Capitals, Terry Pagula was in the building. And it's been pointed out by several media people, no one has seen Pagula at the rink all year. That's not to say he hasn't been there. Maybe he's been in the background. Maybe he's been, you know, sitting in a suite instead of up in the press level with uh, Kevin Adams like he normally does. Um, But nobody has seen Terry at a Sabres game all year. But he was there last night. And we were speculating this morning, like, okay, what's happening there? Is this related to the coach maybe? Or is he just there for Skinner's 1,000th game? Which still could be the case to some degree. But why is he there? Why is he here? What, What did he fly? Why did he fly up for this? And then the next morning, the Diggs trade happens. And I can't get that thought out of my head. The owner's here. 
I mean, he would be a part of that conversation, obviously. It's such a big trade no matter what. But here I've got Stefan Diggs, who he's talking, right? He's tweeting stuff. He's talking in the media. And it's a lot, a lot of it's coded, right? None of it is overt. None of it is, I want to be traded. None of it is, I hate Josh Allen. It's not that direct. It's more, it's indirect, right? Rewind to Ryan O'Reilly. Ryan O'Reilly said something that the organization mo- probably traded him because of. If he never said the comment, I lost my love for the game, he probably doesn't get traded. I don't know. That's not impossible. Part of why they traded O'Reilly that day in July, five six years ago now, is there was a big bonus that was due, and they didn't want to give it to him. So that's why they made the trade at that time, and they had a deadline. But I don't know. I guess my guess is O'Reilly does not get moved if he doesn't say what said if he doesn't say what he said. And I would say the same thing about Diggs. If Diggs isn't out there tweeting, I don't I don't think he's getting traded. I don't know that. We're still early on in this process, but that's my first thought on this. So my wonder is is this a Brandon Bean move or is this a Pagula move? Because the O'Reilly trade is not a Botrol move. Botcherol was basically told, like, you got you got to trade this guy. We we got to trade this guy. It's happening. You, you're you doing it, but this is what you have to do it. And I wonder if that's what happened here with Diggs as well. And I don't like – it doesn't sound good to me. If that's how you got there, you know, over to me that sounds to me like overreacting to stuff a guy says. And that's not good practice. Who cares? It's just tweets. It's just comments. It, it, if the guy – you know, if the guy's being – unhonest about certain things, then I guess I get it. But re- rewinding, the one difference maybe there is, is O'Reilly was not indirect. You know, he was not hiding stuff. Or you weren't having to guess at his motivation or what he meant by something. He just told you, I lost my love for the game, man. Like, I just, that's that's how the season went for me. O'Reilly told you what he, what he meant. And that's what got him traded. And that has never sat well with me. Because... The O'Reilly trade way back when was just how everybody else was feeling. He just said it out loud. All the fans were feeling that way. We're still feeling that way. I guarantee you most of the players were feeling that way. Maybe the coaches were feeling that way. O'Reilly just said the, the hard part out loud, and it got him dealt. And I'm wondering if this is a move where the owner – said like I I would like to move this guy and that is what sparked it because I do but I believe that is exactly what happened when it came to Ryan O'Reilly so again if you want more coverage on the digs trade uh check out locked on bills with Joe Marino I'll be on WGR Thursday morning talking about it beginning to end of the morning show and of course locked on sports today is another avenue to uh, get your coverage on that as well so hope I did the best to uh keep you distracted from uh from the dig stuff but you won't be able to avoid it if you're a buffalo sports fan it's going to be a lot of the, till the start of the season it's going to be the number one thing we're talking about all right sabers on friday against the philadelphia flyers devin levi sent down not my favorite uh i would have liked to see him play some games here before the end of the year but it's fine amex are in a playoff run we'll talk more about them of course too as the season progresses but sabers and flyers friday john tortorella Let's see how mad he is if he loses to the Sabres on Friday. That'd be fun. Thanks for listening here to the Lockdown Sabres podcast. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.